So I'd like to pass you over to my good friend and colleague, Eve, who's going to talk to you a little bit about um, locating climate assemblies within the broader deliberative democracy uh, landscape, and also talk a little bit about how this, um, this spring school is going to, is going to work. Um, enjoy the next two days. It's going to be fantastic. Thanks, mate. OK, uh, great, to great to see you all here. I'll talk a bit less loud. So I'm Eve. I'm from the Federation for Innovation and Democracy Europe. We have a similar role, actually, than NACA, but broadly f uh, focused on deliberative democracy as such. So we try to help with expertise, people who are running or trying to run uh, these types of processes. I will talk to you a bit for this room probably a very low-key introduction, but we always assume there might be people in the room who just come with a blank slate here. So uh, we're running a bit late, so that's good, so I can go a bit quicker, uh, because probably I know a few of you in the room. Some of you have actually run uh, deliberative processes, so some of this might be not really news. And before we get to climate assemblies, just really briefly, you know, what is deliberative democracy? Because 15 years ago, if you talked about the term or, or doing one of these, you really had to explain to people what you were doing. Yes? And so this is actually still a pretty new field. It's actually a form of engaging citizens in policy making, yes, in most cases. And so what is actually what are some of the core features we'll also be talking about uh, during the next two days? You know, a brief reminder of what it is, is it's actually based in two big blocks of characteristics. One being the first, but I'll talk about the second block first, um, is it is a procedure of engaging citizens, but you can also do it with stakeholders, that is very deep and qualitative. Yes, It is actually um, a way of working with your members where you give them a clear task and mandate. Yes, it's a, You give a clear question, a clear task to the people in the room to resolve or to uh, bring recommendations for. You give them a mandate, you will tell them what you will do with the work they will do. Yes? So very much different than from, let's say, an open call in a town hall meeting. Or a, You give them a lot of time. That's also very different from, for example, quick online engagement or a two-hour town hall meeting. Some of these processes, I think one of the people here has been on to the end of life, uh, one in Paris recently that was eight weekends, if I'm not, eight weekends of three days. That's a lot of time. It's thousands of citizen hours. We, we calculate these in citizen hours. You give them balanced information. Yes? In many participation processes, people come with their own information, yes? their own opinion. Yes? In this case, you give information, a balanced range of information. Part of what Eva will talk about, for example, is you know, how do you do uh, this type of task? And then they deliberate. They don't debate, they don't discuss. It's not a who wins or me against you. Deliberation is a very specific way of engaging together, trying to find a common solution, not one group trying to win over the other. This is where facilitation is really, really important. Yes. And then the end, the end product is some recommendations. This can go, the range can go from, I think, seven recommendations in Miskolc in Hungary is one of the smaller ones to close to 200 in some of the bigger national ones. Yes, so a number of recommendations. Now, if you do this, you need a smaller group of people. You cannot do it. Well, you can maybe do this with thousands of people in an idealized theoretical case. Practically, it's, you know, somewhere between 30 to sometimes 200 people. And so if you select a a limited group like here, this could be an assembly, you need a way of selecting those people that is fair and clear to everybody, that people accept as being legitimate. Yes. And so the top thing is what people mention most when they talk about deliberative democracies, the sortition and the random element. But actually, that's just a sort of technical elaboration of that idea that it should be fair who can be part of that small group of people. I'll come back to that because I think it's an important element. So. What are then climate assemblies? Well, if this is deliberative democracy and citizen assemblies or citizen juries in a, in, a, in a different form, then climate assemblies are bringing together everyday people selected by what we call a democratic lottery to learn, deliberate, and make recommendations on aspects of the climate crisis. And why do we have a separate school for 
deliberative democracy on the climate crisis, it is because it brings a number of specific questions to uh, deliberative democracy. Now, for those of you who wouldn't be convinced, but I do my talks also a lot for politicians who still need to be brought over the brink, you know, there's loads of participation already. Why did we bring in something new? This is a recent photo I saw from a, a town hall meeting on a big mobility project in Brussels. Yes, years of preparation work by policy officers redesigning plans to have less cars in the city. This is about climate policy. And then you have public hearings. Yes, this is a public hearing in one of the districts, 130,000 uh, inhabitants. And the result of this evening is that the politicians decided the people are against it. We're going to pause the plan. You can see the big argument is no, with a big sign. So that's, um, it's almost the adverse of deliberative democracy. It's two letters, no, with a, we don't want it. And then I found this very symbolic. You even have one of the citizens who is plugging his ears because it's just shouting. Yes, they had to stop the meeting in the middle. But this is how there is engagement. But the problem with some of this engagement, especially about some of the elements that Graham mentioned, polarized context, difficult decisions to be made. Some of the forms of participation we have will probably not be uh, the way we can go forward. And this is the Irish Assembly on Biodiversity. You see the different kind of contexts. This is thousands of hours of citizen work. If you count every citizen and the number of hours they put in and the information they read and the dozens of experts they hear, talking at tables in a respectful manner. So, there is a lot of participation already, but we need new forms of bringing citizens in. Because without citizens, and this is not only climate, most politicians of, of Mike will agree that they can't do the job alone anymore. You cannot say between elections we're not bringing citizens in anymore. And so this is thinking about new ways to bring citizens in. And what I like to emphasize always, and now this is to this field, is we do a trade-off. Yes, we, we are pro-deliberative democracy, but we actually kind of infringe on one of the normal principles of participation, the first one. We say it's not open. And we sometimes forget this as proponents from deliberative democracy, because we know our thing and we like our thing, but it is really saying we're going to set a citizen participation process up where only 60 people can be part of. Yes, so we actually close the room. Yes, we say we do this trade-off because we can deliver so much more on all the other stuff. Public judgment, not public opinion, less polarized, etc. But so it is a trade-off, and this means that if you close one, we need to think how we can deliver as much as possible on the other. Yes, so, so the other one's, you know, fair, everyone should have an equal chance, democratic lotteries, it's transparent, not always the case, rule-based, Deliberative democracy is based around really procedure, long preparation, rule books, uh, scenarios, and representative. If you look back at the photo from the mobility thing, actually it's almost all men. Yes? But I took it from a media clip where it said, citizens are against. Yes? But who are those citizens? Middle-aged men with a car who were unhappy, I think. Well, I'm making a bit of a, a paraphrase, but a lot of them, I think, were. But that's the public, the citizens. What we say is we close off this thing, but we can deliver much more on these other things. But so we really need to work on delivering them. Now, why do we do this trade-off? Because we say it can deliver better democracy, yes? What we think it can deliver is, for example, more robust and ambitious climate policies. And this is, by the way, the first one is a bit of a tricky one if you think about the deliberative democracy field. There are some people who have been in this field for a while. Normally, in deliberative democracy, we never advocate for deliberative democracy because it will deliver a certain result. Yes. Climate is one of the few where we say we kind of want these procedures because they will deliver better climate policy. Yes. So, if you look again at what we call public opinion, what we in the deliberative field put next to that is public judgment. Yes? And there is also re research and experience supporting that, but you will have more robust and qualitative um, recommendations for policy. 
we can break some political deadlocks. Electoral cycles, elections, they put people who are in politics in a bind. And actually, again, if some of you talk off mic or know a friend or that is in politics, very often politicians don't like that themselves, but they are kind of locked into electoral battles, electoral cycles. They need to think about re-election, they need to think about the party, etc. And so putting something next to that can break some of that political uh, deadlock. It will increase confidence and willingness of political leaders to act on climate, but also on other fields. Yes, we're focusing here on climate. But deliberative processes, well run with a high level of legitimacy, if they come to conclusions that are bold and, and qualitative, you know, citizens will stand next to the politician when they announce some of these measures. Yes? And so it gives a higher legitimacy. Increased legitimacy and public acceptance of social action on climate. If people look at the photo of your assembly and see, like, somebody like me was part of that, and in a very respectful, long, informative, qualitative way, has been part of this process, that gives a high legitimacy, yes? So, especially as transitions begin to impact people more directly. Tough choices will need to be made, and we've seen this also in some of the ethical topics, yes, outside of climate. So again, uh, the end-of-life one in uh, France, euthanasia, very difficult decision, seeing that 185 citizens for weekends and weekends on end, listening to everybody come to this certain decision. It also means for the outside public, if they really perceive this as a legitimate uh, way of working, it'll increase the legitimacy of tough choices. And then a more climate-aware and politically confident citizenry. Yes. Now, a number of, and I'm going to go for this room, not too long, but again, I still talk to people for whom this is completely new and revolutionary. So, some more benefits for the deliberative democracy in general, and these come from an OECD report that some of us have been part in writing uh, on good governance. You know, you make governance more inclusive. What we sometimes forget is how many people are not in the room in many forms of participation. I was recently part of a of an expert group on an online consultation, and in the end, the data showed 80% of the participants were men, and close to 80% had a university degree. That is not inclusive. If we take decisions as participation based on these forms of participation, we're really excluding a lot of citizens from giving voice. Yes, so we have a much more diverse group of people. Comes with a lot of difficulty. Yes, the practitioners here in the room or who have done facilitation, it really means adapting to making that inclusion also work. Bringing people just in the room is not sufficient and having them sit on a chair. So, it's work. You strengthen the integrity and you can prevent corruption. I also talk to, sometimes, people who are in countries where this really matters. Yes? Transparency, openness of information. We know that stakeholders talk to politicians, but we don't always know what they say when they're in the room. Yes? Even if there is a transparency register, you know that XYZ talk to politician XYZ, yes? if there is already a transparency register. You have no clue what the arguments were or what was said or what. In a deliberative process, all of this is done on stage, publicly. Yes? And so, in some countries, really, there is an importance of transparency as such being the important element of a deliberative process. I've already mentioned this. It can help counteract polarization and disinformation because Think again about those citizens in the room for the 130,000. Approximately 300 people can fit in that room, in that city hall. Who is there? It is your strongly angry people. It's the one who want to throw bricks. And they should still have an avenue to vent that, but they shouldn't guide the decisions. Yes? And at this moment, a lot of public space is for those who are angry. We know, for example, that on Twitter, it's a fraction of the percentage of the population that is there, but we very often refer to these types of de debates as being, you know, citizens want to throw bricks at each other. So bringing a more diverse and just generic group of citizens in the room can really counter polarization. And then research has shown us citizens in a deliberative process think about longer policy horizons. Yes, I'm just mentioning one of uh, the persons who was part of our organization 
uh, Professor Kaluarts, who was part of the G1000, the Belgian organization where I started in this work. He's done a lot of research and experimentation with this, and you can really see that people take longer time horizons. They think about longer times when you take them out of an electoral, party political way of thinking about uh, solutions. And for climate, this is a crucial one, because climate solutions will sometimes run over decades or longer term. Yes. Now, good news. We've had loads of climate assemblies. Yes. Many countries already had them at the national level. Yes, so you can see, I'm not going to name them all. I, can, I think we have people involved in six of these national assemblies. Some, some were more ambitious, some were longer, some were shorter. But we have some experience, and this also means we have a sort of first lessons we can draw from the first iteration of these. If you look at the local level, and Graham already said it, you can come up to 100 first experiences. Yes. Now, some of these, like at local level, there's been a boom in the UK at some point, a bit driven, I think, by Extinction Rebellion also, cl claiming. So some, some countries have really had uh, strong, you can see on the regional level, the UK is really uh, outspoken, but we have some experience. Yes. So what have those first experiences told us? Well, yes, everyday citizens are willing for those of you who've done this already, are willing and able to learn. Yes, They will deliberate, they will not throw bricks at each other, and they will come to robust recommendations for climate policy. Yes, They are, very often, more progressive. Yes, Some visible cases, like the French Scottish Assembly, have come up with recommendations that visibly were more progressive than current policy. But, and this is part of the lessons learned, we'll also talk about this, Graham, amongst others, has a session on linking it much more to policy. Impact has been limited. Yes. There has been some impact, but it hasn't been the complete turnover of climate policy in all the places these have done in one go. Now, if you think about impact, we think mostly about the top of these four. It's policy. Yes. Our first idea of impact is it changes a law, it changes a plan, yes, or a, a climate plan of a city. But actually, we can look at, at this more broadly. Yes. For example, some of the impact, uh, a lot of work of NACA has shown, is on institutions. Yes, some of the impact might be a bit slower, but long-term, that institutions start thinking about citizen engagement on climate differently. Yes, so that there is also a change in recognizing after that first iteration. This wasn't perfect, but actually this is a valuable way of working with citizens. And so institutional change happens. Public, it might be that n immediately the speed on the motorway in France is not reduced. This was one of the very visible and much debated ones uh, in France. But it was very much debated which means citizens were suddenly reflecting on, well, this group of citizens actually was very much for this after long deliberations. So you get an extensive public debate if it is very communicated and it's, it's visible. And so this can increase your impact on the public. And, and this we know from deliberative democracy in general, it has a very strong impact on participants. Specifically on climate, they come out even more climate aware than if they were already climate aware, people who were a bit thinking that climate action wasn't really needed sometimes come out changing their life. There is a, a clip from the 150 citizens of the French Climate Assembly. There's a, a movie made of how they changed their lives after being part of the assembly. Some quit their jobs, several sold their cars, uh, became vegetarian, so there's a strong impact. And even on some expert speakers. A beautiful example I know from one of the NACA uh, learning calls was the person who did the Austrian one, saying that some of the experts talking to the citizens then started going to demonstrations of citizens for climate or becoming media spokespersons at those demonstrations. They wouldn't glue themselves to the motorway, but they would stand next to those who did and then justify why what these citizens were doing. So they became actually a bit activist experts by being part of the assembly. So, what are still a number of limitations we have? It's 
and we'll talk about some of these. Kelly will talk about mandates. The climate is, for example, a big policy field. It touches on all policy fields. So, for example, sometimes mandates have been too broad. They can also be too narrow. So, the first lessons have also been a bit about how much can you put in one assembly to solve, for example, the national climate question. Limited investment in recruitment, you know, so the robustness of some of these procedures, sometimes it's just, and we've heard this from, from many people, for example, at local authority, having resources is not always easy, yes? So sometimes you were asked to do an amazing thing on climate, but with limited resources. If you want to get people in the room that are never there and guide them and help them on inclusion, you need resources, you need time, you need good facilitators. You can't do on a day and a half, you know, solve the climate crisis for our, you know, for our country. And so it is about having enough time, but sometimes then people will be told, oh, we have a few 10,000 euros for this process. So um, robust, you know, good investment. Skepticism of climate actors. On the next slide, I'll have the reverse but you still have established stakeholders, people in the middle, who are skeptical about this new thing uh, being set up. For example, in Belgium, this included a number of journalists and still does. Most of them older white men who write opinion pages and think that citizens especially need them. But some, my org the organization I'm also involved in in Belgium, some of our fierce Nemesis are a few journalists who every time we set up an assembly will write big opinion pieces how this is, you know, what a naive idea. And so there are some people who really are um, still, who have established positions and see this as, as a threat or something new that for them is, um, we had strong stakeholder opposition also from some specific stakeholders in the first processes we ran. And then, and this is what Graham will, will talk about in his, uh, uh, part is integration in the political system. These things have to work with politics and with the administration, and probably also in the beginning, also deliberative democracy experts have focused a bit too much on the citizen part of thing, and the less how does this actually land in policy cycles and laws and, and legal procedures that are there, and etc. So uh, that also has been a bit of an issue. So what are the current debates, and then? Um, I'll, I'll wrap this up. So now we're much more looking at how to link this to policy cycles, administration. Yes? A lot of the resources we're more emphasizing now when we talk to politicians on what do you need for this is to make sure that your administration can handle what comes out of assemblies as much as how to run the assemblies. A th uh, second thing is, especially around climate, is institutionalization. If the climate will be our major challenge for decades on all policy fields, one assembly will not hack it, to say it like that. So much more, we're looking at how can you institutionalize this type of assemblies in a continuous way in your policy, yes? So there are people here from the city of Milan who are doing this. They have a project until 2030, for example, on their climate plan, so for a long period to engage continuously citizens. The Brussels capital region installed a permanent climate assembly with its own agenda setting body, uh, which has citizens to feed into uh, topical assemblies. City of Bologna, I think also a few people are here who work on that, also installed a more permanent assembly. So again, these are first iterations and learnings we're doing, but this is uh, the new debates in the field. And then the flip side from the stakeholders who are reticent, you have some social movements also, well, some climate activists who really advocate for assemblies because there is this sense that this will really turn, a turn around climate policy in one go. So these are a bit the three um, things going in the field, the current debates. Now, how do you want to succeed this? Of course, participate in these two days and uh, you know, learn, learn what you can learn. But what I would say very briefly, first of all, ambition, and again, this is a talk I also often do for politicians, but if you do them, have some ambition. Even if it's small, that's my thing between brackets. Sometimes you don't have all the coalition partners along, or you're some people in your administration, if you're a policy officer, are like, oh, are you doing this? So, you know, we are easy talking from the stage, but try to be ambition 
ambitious in the thing, in the little, even if this is a smaller thing, and then build on that. Your first iteration might not be perfect, might not be immediately cross-party or the big thing, but have ambition or try to uh, be ambitious as far as you can go, and then shift gears. Very often, just showing that something works is the best advocacy for a more, you know, a broader, more ambitious second round. Your follow-up needs to be serious and planned. Again, Graham will talk about this, but we've also done some work on that with FIDE. In the beginning, this was really lacking. Where will recommendations land? You know, how will they actually fit into uh, changing uh, policy and climate policy? So this is the, and then how it will land in the administration, not only in laws, and, but uh, the administration is where the work then needs to be done. Yes, if we've heard examples of places where suddenly dozens of recommendations landed in a certain administration. You know, here you work in the mobility service, we've run a climate assembly, you didn't hear of it, here are 50 recommendations, could you please reply to them? Three pages per recommendation, see how they fit in the current plan you're working on, and you'll go like, I have a full-time job, I already have overtime, I couldn't recuperate, so thanks for this great plan. And if you don't think how this will kind of click into your administration, it might also end there, right, or, or slowly end in a shelf. And then budget the needed resources. I know many of you would kind of applaud this and want more resources. Again, this is up to the politicians, but some of the resources are not money, are time, yes? For example, if you want to be inclusive, you do your recruitment, you have a telephone line, and you contact your citizens to prepare them. That is somebody who just in your administration needs time. Yeah, so advocating for time for this, uh, at your deputy chief or your, it might not always be about money. Yes, it's the resources very often also time. And then of course, use expertise or how uh, one of the Danish presenters in the previous school said the first time I did an assembly, I stole whatever I could steal. I just looked it up and I, um, she even said at some point between sessions, she called other practitioners in other countries. I'm at this point in the assembly. Uh, we're here. We have a coffee break now. What do we do up next? So, you know, find resources, S steal stuff. It is, it is hard and it's a lot. It's like some have said, I think, Eva, this has come from you. It's like organizing a wedding. I think this is a metaphor you used. It is a lot, right? So steal and take whatever you can. We have some of those resources in the back. We've printed them out, both NACA, FIDE, and also New Democracy Foundation. Uh, Luca is from the Australian New Democracy Foundation. Uh, they also have a great website with lots of resources. You know, take and read whatever you can. Um, and then come to these events. So this was a more generic introduction. All the other sessions will be much more topical. So. We'll have two types, Graham already said this, we'll have two types of sessions. We'll have more broad...